Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, my name is Susan Stigant. I'm the director of the Africa program here, um, and very pleased uh, to welcome you for this conversation to take a look at what's happening on the Horn and Gulf dynamics. Um, for those of you who don't know USIP, we are an independent federal institute um, founded in 1984 and dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible. Um, but I have to say that what we're seeing in the Horn at the moment suggests even further that peace is challenging and reminds us that conflict and violence is also very possible. Um, so I'm not going to take any further time because we have a really tremendous panel um, and I think they have a lot of ideas to share. We also have um, people with deep experience and ideas in the audience and we hope there will be an opportunity for some exchange. So um, let me hand it over to Peyton Knopf who coordinates our South Sudan Senior Working Group um, and who has been some of the, the mind and the drive behind this conversation um, and, and unpacking and trying to link the Africa and Near East um, dynamics. So, Peyton. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, this has uh, proven to be a very timely conversation, even though we had this pre-planned uh, uh, before some of the recent developments around Eritrea involving uh, Ethiopia and Sudan and Egypt and, uh, and the Emirates. So um, we really appreciate you all being here. Um, let me just briefly introduce, as Susan said, an extraordinary panel that we have here today. Um, and then we'll, uh, each of them will give uh, some brief remarks at the outset. Uh, and then we'll turn quickly to a moderated conversation and leave plenty of time for uh, you all to, to ask questions and, and to comment. Um, this conversation is on the record and is being recorded. It is not being live streamed, but it will ultimately be posted on uh, the USIP um, website. So. Um, to introductions. To my right uh, is Abdetta Bayan. Abdetta is an extraordinarily uh, experienced, uh, not just scholar, but diplomat, uh, who has wrestled firsthand with these issues for some uh, years. Uh, he served as a desk officer for Ethiopia's neighboring states of Somalia, Djibouti, Sudan, and Eritrea. He served in uh, various embassies throughout the region, in Djibouti and Hargeisa, uh, as the chief of the cabinet of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as the uh, Ethiopia's special envoy to Somalia, uh, and as head of the conflict early warning and response unit. Uh, he also uh, found time to get himself a PhD from Northwestern uh, University, and he's now the executive um, director of the Center for Dialogue, Research, and Cooperation uh, in Addis. Um, to my left is Ambassador Princeton Lyman, who uh, probably needs no introduction uh, for this audience. Um, Ambassador Lyman has nearly served in uh, or dealt with uh, all of these issues, again, sort of firsthand. Um, he was president, uh, he's currently the uh, senior advisor to the um, to the president of USIP. He was previously uh, the US Special Envoy uh, for Sudan and South Sudan from March 2011 to uh, March 2012, uh, where he helped uh, support the implementation of the 2005 Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Um, he was formerly uh, the, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, U.S. Ambassador to South Africa during the critical 1992 to 1995 period, uh, and uh, endless uh, number of other senior uh, diplomatic uh, posts. Uh, at the end uh, of the table is Michael Wahid Hanna. Um, Michael is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. He's also an adjunct senior fellow at the Center on Law and Security at New York University School of Law. Uh, he's a specialist in security, uh, excuse me, international security, international law, and foreign policy in the Middle East and South Asia. Uh, Michael directed the Century Foundation's 2015 International Working Group on Pakistan, which was chaired by Ambassador Tom Pickering, um, and has served as a co-director of the Century Foundation's 2011 International Task Force on Afghanistan, chaired by Ambassador Pickering, uh, as well as Lakhdar uh, Brahimi. He's published uh, uh, widely in both scholarly journals and in the press uh, and is, is, uh, has deep experience on a number of the issues that we're going to discuss today. And then finally, to my far right, uh, is Aneta Weber. Aneta is a senior fellow uh, in the Middle East and Africa Research Division of the German Institute for International and Security Studies in Berlin. Uh, her regional expertise is in the Horn, uh, conflict analysis, fragile states, non-state actors, 
um, and a number of other issues, again, relevant to this uh, conversation. Uh, Aneta has served, uh, served, has worked uh, and studied extensively uh, in the region. So uh, is very, very well placed to, uh, in fact, start us off today. So um, I will, Aneta has just recently published for uh, the German Institute for International Affairs a paper called Red Sea Connector and Divider, uh, which uh, I'm going to ask Aneta to sort of uh, contextualize for us some of the events that we, uh, I think all of you here, have been following over the last uh, two weeks, uh, the, the sort of escalating tensions and volatility uh, in the horn. Uh, sadly, it's not new, uh, but it very much speaks to, I think, the, the interconnected and cross-cutting political and security dynamics uh, on both sides of the Red Sea that we're trying to, uh, that we're aiming to discuss today and to, to elaborate upon. So, um, Annette, if I could turn to you to sort of Tell us what's actually going on here and <laughs> where did this come from? Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Um, what's going on here and where did this come from? And, and you already said it, um, connector and divider. It's not an either or. But um, what we see right now is um, basically an, an influx from policies from the Gulf states to, to the Horn of Africa. But I would like to start of on um, describing a bit on the background on the Horn of Africa and the, and the regional dynamics and then see what the, what the policies and, and the interactions from the Gulf um, are doing there. And then um, maybe we can, we can enter into this discussion. I think there are two issues or two topics um, important to me um, when looking at these two regions. Do the two regions conceive themselves as regions? Do they have a regional identity or do they basically have much more of a national or um, sub-regional interests um, that are that are coming before the regional identity, and do they conceive or do they perceive themselves as part of a region that is a Red Sea region, or is it the Horn of Africa and the Gulf and um, bilateral, maybe only bilateral uh, relationships, but not a regional um, perception? And of course, to this comes the question of, um, of collective security issues, and I think this is where I would say one of the bigger problems we, we see in, in the Horn of Africa is that there is no collective security understanding or no interest in having a collective security because the countries, most of the countries are working against each other more or less rather than, than united. Albeit we have, and I think this is one of the big differences and a, a, a big plus on, on the Horn of Africa, um, we do have institutions, we do have the African Union, we do have EGAD um, that we don't see reflected um, across the shore um, in, 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 in amongst the Gulf countries. And I think this is what is important and where um, the work on collective security um, is, is possible on, on the Horn, but how is it possible to go beyond the Horn and, and see the Red Sea as, um, as that center for collective security. Um, just to run through a couple of issues that are of concern in the Horn of Africa um, way before the, 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 the Gulf influence. And of course, the issues of um, importance are also issues of interest, at least to the Europeans, but also we will hear later um, definitely to, to not only the Europeans, but also to, um, to the Americans. For the Europeans, it's important because it's, it's our neighboring country and um, the trade routes going through the, the Suez Canal and the Gulf, um, and not the Gulf, the Red Sea, are of vital importance to, uh, to European economy. What is also important is the migration issue. And migration in the Red Sea is, is a topic that is not just of importance to the Europeans, but it's a topic much more important between the Horn of Africa and the Gulf states because most of the migrants from Sudan, let's say, and Ethiopia are not planning to go um, further to, to Europe, but are actually migrating um, towards <coughs> Saudi Arabia and other, other Gulf states. We have a militarization a lot, uh, um, along the, the Red Sea coast. Um, Djibouti definitely is basically the, the country or the state that, is, um, that can be described as, as a country that is existing mostly by, by hosting um, military bases, military bases including military bases for, red, uh, for Gulf countries such as the, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, but also military bases for, of course, France, who had the first military base there, the, the United States, and, um, and China was the only military base out, outside of their um, zone of influence. We have the Red Sea as, um, 
as a divider and, and uniter for traveling jihadis, not so many or not so much traveling jihadis between uh, al-Qaeda of the Parab uh, Arab Peninsula and al-Shabaab, but of, um, intellect, uh, but of um, their ideas, but also their weapons that are traveling. We have the Red Sea as a divider and connector in terms of um, um, trafficking. We have it as um, smuggling of arms. So we have, we have organized crime as a connector of, of the two sides. We have piracy. This is where um, all of our countries are, are involved in, in fighting piracy. That is part of um, the, the Red Sea. Um, yes, so we, we do see that, that Red Sea as, um, as a region of security and security concern, but also as a region of, of collective interest. I would like to go just quickly through the maybe last couple of years where we could see an influence from the, from the Gulf states predominantly because of their interest in food security, um, the Yemen war and the GCC split. And I think this is, these are the three waves um, with a lot of consequences for the Horn of Africa. Consequences for, for the Horn of Africa that changed the dynamic in the Horn of Africa <laughs> and brought some of the countries to the fore that we haven't seen or we have seen being much more isolated beforehand. With the, with the drop of the oil prices and the food security issue for the, for the Gulf states, 70% of their food security is coming from outside, predominantly agricultural investment in Sudan and Ethiopia. We have um, Sudan and Ethiopia being highlighted as, as important um, to the United Arab Emirates and, um, and, and Saudi Arabia. We have the Yemen war where, again, Sudan is becoming very important for the, for the Saudi uh, alliance. Um, Eritrea as well. Eritrea was becoming important for the Saudi alliance, but also Eritrea made use of that alliance um, to bring themselves back into the conversation, let's say, because um, their port in Asab is now lent to the Arab, um, United Arab, um, Arab Emirates as a port for the, for the war in, in Yemen. And so Eritrea is playing a much bigger role than they have been playing, um, let's say, the years before. Um, in this conversation, Ethiopia, I think, is, is suffering most because it's being more and more isolated. And I think Abdeta, Abdeta will, will talk about their, their internal um, issues much more. But it's being more isolated because the militarization of the Red Sea is, is basically a threat to Ethiopia, but they have no say in, in that militarization because they, they're not um, a country that, that has support at the, um, at the Red Sea. And maybe my last part before I'm handing over, um, what we've also seen is, is um, because of the GCC split, um, a split or a fragmentation in the Horn of Africa where countries had to divide themselves or had to, were forced basically to take sides between um, Saudi Arabia and, and the United Arab Emirates and Qatar on the other side. And I think this is, we might have this conversation here later as well. This is also an indicator for um, a discussion on uh, political Islam that we see the, the Horn of Africa being much more divided on than it has been three, four years ago. So I keep it there, and thank you. Thank you very much, Aneta. And I should have said that we have some copies of Aneta's uh, excellent paper uh, that she referenced here. It can also be found on the SWP uh, website for those who would like to, to look for it. Um, it's very important, I think, context for, for uh, some understanding some of the recent uh, developments that have been in the news. We were having a conversation just before walking in here where somebody noted that uh, Sana'a is actually geographically closer to Addis Ababa than it is to Riyadh, which I think puts into, into relief uh, some of the dynamics that we're, that we're talking about here today. Um, so I wonder, uh, Ambassador Lyman, if you could, um, you know, in the context of what uh, Aneta's raised, when we talk about some of these tensions around the Nile Basin over the use of the Nile, some of these tensions across uh, the Red Sea and the militarization of the Red Sea, you could talk about how that impacts U.S. interests. We have uh, Lauren Plock Ranchard, actually, from the Congressional Research Service, calculated the United States spends somewhere around $4.5 billion a year in the Horn of Africa across uh, humanitarian security peacekeeping development uh, efforts. It's a tremendous investment. Um, and how does that, uh, how do the tensions there and, and the overall dynamic impact U.S. interests and influence? Uh, thanks, Peyton. Thanks very much. Thanks, Annette. Um, 
Look, our interests are very great. We are invested heavily, Brayton has talked about the cost, uh, in the peace and security of the Horn. But these changes that are taking place, this uh, relationship and cross-relationships uh, between um, the, across the Gulf and to the Arab countries and their influence on, on the politics of uh, Africa are changing the dynamics very much. Uh, just as an example, South Sudan gets drawn in and plays on these various differences, and that makes the peace process in South Sudan much more difficult. Uh, the pressures on Ethiopia that Annette mentioned, Ethiopia is the key player for the United States, but if it can't play the role that it usually plays as a leader within EGAD and the AU in bringing about the peace process, that's a very serious problem for us. But what's really uh, extraordinary, when you look at what's happening in the Gulf, with not only the, interest, the Arab interests coming in, but the Turkish interests coming in, the pre president of Turkey coming to Sudan, talking about uh, uh, taking over development of an island in the Red Sea, the very strong reaction uh, from Saudi Arabia, et cetera. Um, just think about that. Bureaucratically, that involves three different bureaus of the State Department. The European Bureau, where Turkey is, the Africa Bureau, and the Middle East Bureau. How do we develop a policy which takes all this into account because we have so much at stake? We have so much at stake not only in the horn, but with these various players, like Saudi Arabia, uh, like Turkey, in so many dimensions. So, Given the stakes we have, and they're very heavy, we need a structure of policy that is higher up over the three bureaus that can bring together and integrate a policy in the horn that takes account of these special interests. And we have special interests in Turkey. We have special interests in Egypt outside the horn. We've relied on Ethiopia very heavily in a number of ways. So that has to be integrated at a high level so we can take account of the changes that have taken place in the Horn. Let me give you just a, a, a personal example. I was the envoy for Sudan South Sudan for two years. I would not propose an envoy for Sudan South Sudan today because it's too limited a part of the dynamic that's going on in the region that affects that peace process. We need something that takes into account a larger. And, you know, uh, given the stake and given that amount of money, four and a half billion dollars a year is a lot of money, it's holding on to the status quo, but it's not moving us toward the peace we need in, the, in this area. So our interests are great and they're touched on in so many different ways that we need a new way of looking at it, identifying our interests very clearly. So we can do it, talk to Egypt, we can talk to Turkey, we can talk to Sudan, which is now playing quite an interesting, different role. E uh, Eritrea, with which we have a very quirky relationship, if at all. And the importance of Ethiopia to this whole process and develop a clear set of what our interests are. I think they're very great. And I think what this analysis illuminates is we need to come at it in a different way. Sorry, excuse me, a different way. Thank you, Ambassador Lyman. Um, Abdetta, if I could turn to you to say a few words about how some of these uh, dynamics are viewed from, from Addison, from the Horn, uh, more broadly. Uh, th thank you. Uh, for someone from the Horn uh, of Africa, uh, one would look at the developments from the Gulf and its imp impact across across the, the region, probably in, in three, four, uh, four layers. One is globally, th there are major actors who are competing for influence, whose uh, members have grown tremendously uh, these days. Uh, this is easy to see. One can see the United States, which appears to be in a, a, in a retreat uh, from, from the region. Uh, we have the European Union, although uh, Brexit had uh, impacted it uh, a little bit. We have China, Russia on, on the other side, and uh, the Turkish uh, as well, uh, which of course uh, has been explained by uh, Richard Haas. Um, on the existence of non-polarity non in the in world uh, uh, po 
political arrangements currently. Um, of course, one can see also that in the Middle East, the Sunni Shia uh, competition and sometimes rivalry uh, has been manipulated in dif for different purposes, and the outcomes are uh, mixed. For example, Iran, the Houthis, and Hezbollah are on one side, and the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Qataris, and the Sudanese, and to some extent, the Turkish um, uh, share a sect of alliance uh, on on the other. But when one sees the, the subdivision within the Sunnis, you will find uh, uh, um, divisions between uh, between these actors, which forces, of course, the, the entire Horn of Africa region uh, Muslim community, which is more or less uh, a Sunni uh, follower, but doesn't com compartmentalize itself into what you see in the in in the Middle East as a Sunni uh, Shia um, uh, division. Of course. The fourth layer, uh, which I see uh, personally, is is reflected at the local level in the Horn of Africa, related to the Nile waters, the role of Egypt in, in the Horn of Africa, uh, the structural placement of Egypt in in, in uh, as part of the Middle East by by Western powers, which helps um, uh, evade sc scrutiny of what. Uh, is happening in, in terms of Egypt and, 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 and the Horn of Africa, uh, etc. We, we, we find now probably competitions in South Sudan with respect to Eritrea and, and Libya also impacting uh, the relationship between some Gulf countries and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the Horn. I think uh, the elephant in, in, in the room he, here is uh, the, the development of uh, the Nile Dam. Uh, uh, a project that has uh, that has brought a, a paradigm shift in, in which um, the use of the Nile uh, has to has to change from the status quo, uh, especially with respect to how Sudan handles uh, the outcome of uh, of the dam, because the dam in, in reality controls the flow of waters and helps Sudan plan further. Uh, in which, for example, the Sudanese foreign minister said that the dam will allow Sudan to use what is allocated for uh, Sudan from the 1959 uh, agreement. So this major shift that should be taken into consideration is witnessed also in, in, the, relation, in the relationship between Sudan and, 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 and Egypt. As you all recall, uh, that Sudan and Egypt were together among the, uh, the comprehensive uh, framework agreement signatories, uh, Egypt and, and Sudan have yet to, to, to sign uh, the comprehensive framework agreement. But the Nile Dam has, has brought uh, a, a new dynamism uh, uh, into, into this. Of course, obviously, um, the differences between Egypt and Sudan widen due to various problems. One is the uh, dispute uh, over the Halaib uh, uh, triangle. Uh, Sudan's deals with, uh, with Turkey re re recently uh, regarding Soakin Islands, um, even if the issue has been there for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, but the visit of, of uh, the president of Turkey has triggered some reaction uh, to, to that effect. And at the same time, the changing uh, relationship between some Gulf countries and the Horn of Africa, who, whose relationship was somehow uh, previously dominated by, uh, by uh, the role of uh, Egypt. Uh, although Sudan has been very close to Iran previously and, and Qatar, the process of lifting the, the US sanctions on Khartoum demanded the political support from other Gulf countries, uh, which are closer to the US, uh, which eventually forced the Sudan to to cut its relationship with with, with Iran, um, and at the same time, of course, uh, uh, Sudan uh, uh, agreed to support the war in in Yemen and, and, and is fully fully engaging. Probably that uh, role of uh, Sudan in uh, in Yemen is helping to relieve some of the pressures that uh, that Sudan is facing from. Uh, from uh, um, Egypt these days. Um, in, in general, I think these regional realities 
uh, even forcing countries considered to be failed states to, to take positions uh, uh, on developments uh, in the Greater Horn of uh, Africa in relation to the division within the GCC. Um, you will all recall uh, that Somalia, uh, almost a failed state, now uh, the federal government at the center is uh, at least stating neutral, but, uh, but sympathetic to, to Qatar, while the regional administrations who are supposed to cooperate and uh, revive the Somali state uh, are uh, supporting uh, the positions uh, uh, taken, taken by Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, some of the Gulf uh, uh, cooperation uh, countries. Uh, this uh, also is an indicative that the process of rebuilding Somalia will, will, will continue to, to be challenged because those divisions within, within the Gulf states uh, have yet to be resolved. Uh, it means the, the federal states and the federal government at the center will continue uh, uh, the, uh, parallelly in, uh, in re, um, configuring the, um, uh, the Somali state will will continue uh, to face uh, to face uh, a, a challenge. These different levels of analysis then influence the way actors in the Horn of Africa behave. Some are looking uh, at the short-term interests and change side to suit their objectives and goals, as well as others uh, accrue some financial uh, gains. Some have uh, shifted their policies towards individual car Gulf countries. Um, uh, of course, uh, the war uh, in Yemen has brought some windfall incomes to, to, uh, to sidelined actors. Uh, that is why um, we should look at developments in the Gulf and in, uh, in the Horn of Africa having that complex uh, challenges facing uh, all of us. And we expect uh, the U.S. Uh, to come back and uh, take, uh, take uh, its responsibilities uh, because we feel tho those in the region uh, that the U.S. somehow has abandoned its responsibilities and it should, uh, it should take that. Thank you. It's a very sobering uh, point to, to <laughs> conclude your opening remarks on. Michael, if you could talk a little bit about the view from, uh, from Cairo, from Riyadh, from Abu Dhabi, what's animating some of those strategies and approaches towards this region? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I guess one thing that, that seems to be happening quite quickly, um, kind of o overview, is that uh, for, from Egypt's perspective, the, the, we have this escalating crisis over uh, the dam. Uh, and, and what is notable uh, of late is the way in which that is intersecting and converging uh, in a regionalized fashion with some of the other dynamics that are already happening uh, uh, in terms of uh, Gulf involvement. And these things seem to be uh, converging in a way that is, I think, quite new uh, and potentially quite um, destabilizing and worrisome. Uh, for Egypt, Obviously, the dam is, um, at this point, um, something of an existential issue. Egypt's relationship um, to Africa has, has, um, has weakened uh, over recent decades. I mean, uh, in the period, in the early 2000s, as Egypt was very inward focused on, on the succession, the kind of late Mubarak period, there was generalized drift in Egyptian foreign policy. Uh, and. Um, that was even more accentuated with respect to Africa. Some of those traditional uh, bonds had atrophied and, and withered. Uh, and timing is important in this, in this, uh, in this uh, series of, of developments uh, because as this core dispute around the dam uh, gathers momentum, I think initially uh, there was skepticism on the Egyptian side that this is, was a feasible uh, uh, project. I think some of that is uh, Egyptian chauvinism at play with respect to um, attitudes towards Africa. I think that they uh, believed that initially that, that financing was simply going to be prohibitive and impossible, uh, and that for it to happen would have to be a kind of regionalized process uh, that they would eventually have input in. Uh, and I think we're quite surprised um, at the speed with which uh, Ethiopia was able to uh, put financing essentially on its own in place. Uh, and by the time the project became feasible and live, um, the big problem for Egypt is this is essentially 2011. Uh, so we have uh, the uprising, January 25th, we have the fall of Mubarak, uh, which ushers in a period of some chaos, some drift, uh, real inward focusing, 
the dam is obviously quite important, um, but it it isn't number one priority. I mean, it's it's a sort of uh, you know, an issue, an intangible issue that obviously is going to impact at some point in the future. Uh, but the period of 2011, 2013 is a period of tumult in Egypt. We have protests in the street, we have uh, violence and, uh, and uh, real uh, core questions about the future of the country, the identity of the country. And so the issue of the dam, um, unfortunately, sort of falls by, uh, by the wayside. Uh, and so timing is quite important. You have this loss of focus and, and can being consumed by domestic uh, affairs. Um, when 2013 happens, we have the overthrow of Morsi in July 2013. Um, it ushers in an, another problematic dynamic for this set of issues, and that is hypernationalism. Right? I mean, this is a military-led overthrow. Um, you have a period really in 2013 and 2014 of, of kind of runaway nationalism. Uh, and interaction with this question of the dam is quite problematic. Um, it's often overheated. Um, I think it also, at a societal level, reflects uh, generalized Egyptian ignorance about sub-Saharan Africa. It, it is just not a topic of um, social knowledge. Uh, that, and it shows in, in, in many of the ways in which Egypt as a society or Egyptian press talks about these issues uh, quite distinct from the way that it relates to the Arab world. You see that distance, um, that lack of social uh, knowledge or connection to sub-Saharan Africa writ large, and then this issue um, in, um, in particular. Um, and so we have this, this con recurring contradiction this potentially existential issue, uh, you know, the, for, for the Egyptians, the, the kind of the first immediate issue, and, and I'm not an expert on, on these water issues, but obviously how long it takes to fill the reservoir has huge impact in terms of, uh, uh, of water that will eventually reach uh, Egypt uh, uh, and a vulnerable sort of water scarce country um, to begin with. Um, and, and, and if we look to, to sort of the present, to the very immediate present, um, you know, the kind of tumult that I was talking about continues. So just yesterday, um, apparently, uh, CC has sacked the head of general intelligence, someone who actually had, um, th this is considered a national security issue, someone who actually had an important voice to play in these discussions within the Egyptian government. Um, he's been sidelined. Um, and so it's just reflective of the, of the fact that this, um, you know, this, I wouldn't say instability, because I don't, I don't think that's quite accurate, but this is still a consolidating regime. There's still uh, quite a bit of churn, um, and that, you know, continues to affect Egypt's ability to um, focus uh, clearly on these, on these issues. Um, you mentioned Sudan, and of course, um, in, in the interim, we have had the aggravation of uh, existing Egyptian Sudanese uh, uh, disputes, many of them long-standing, like Haleb, um, and uh, of course, there's long-standing issues that the Egypt has had with the Sudanese with respect to their relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood that continue. Um, but uh, what appears to the Egyptians to be uh, a moving away from Egypt's position on the dam toward Ethiopia, I think, which is justified in terms of perception, um, has has triggered these um, these issues. Uh, and of course, what's overlaid on top of all of this is um, some of the regional realignment that is happening. I mean, I I, I think. We shouldn't get too carried away in terms of seeing these as kind of very uh, uh, firm divisions. Um, Egypt and Saudi have had very difficult relations. Even Egypt and UAE have had some difficult relations of late. Uh, when Salman uh, succeeded Abdullah, there was a period in which there was Saudi Qatari uh, rapprochement or an attempt at it at least. Um, but of course, what has happened most recently has been um, in some ways a, a, a diplomatic boon to Egypt um, that brought them very close uh, together with the Saudis and the Emiratis in terms of the crisis with uh, Qatar. Uh, but this, G this GCC crisis has again, as we've, uh, and I won't go into it, it's already been mentioned, but it's played itself out in terms of, uh, um, uh, of these other uh, disputes within the region. And obviously it has seen uh, Egypt taking positions in the Horn of Africa that are um, somewhat new um, and play into this a broader sense of, uh, of, of polarization and division along uh, a realignment in the region. Uh, Tur Turkey-Sudan issues are playing into this. Uh, Egypt is obviously, there's a lot of, I think, somewhat sensationalized reports about Egypt's relationship with Eritrea, where the Emiratis have a, a military base. Um, but that is um, inflaming and uh, broadening the conflict in a way uh, that makes it 
uh, much harder to deal with. Um, and it's happening very quickly. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's really important. I mean, I, you know, it's not that one doesn't need to be alarmist, um, but a lot has happened uh, in the past two years. Uh, and that cycle seems to be um, accelerating uh, in a lot of ways. Um, others have talked about uh, UAE and Saudi involvement. Um, uh, and uh, maybe we can get into that a little more in the discussion. I don't want to take up too much time. But uh, particularly the Emiratis have been quite aggressive uh, for a variety of reasons, having to do with uh, commercial investments, having to do with the war in Yemen, having to do with uh, projection of power. Power projection is, is quite important uh, to the Emiratis at the, at the moment. Um, but uh, the question of misperception, uh, the lack of transparency about what exactly um, uh, these kinds of relationships are, what they're intended to do, uh, what is Turkey doing on this island? Is this a uh, port development? Is this a military base? Uh, if it is a, a kind of a, a military installation, uh, naturally that's going to uh, raise concerns among the Egyptians, among the Saudis, among the Emiratis. Uh, this is a quite unnatural projection of po power in the modern era. Um, and uh, it's a period of, of military modernization. Egypt is... Um, uh, is, is undergoing naval modernization. Some of that is directed toward the Eastern Mediterranean, the natural gas there. Uh, but of course, um, that kind of military buildup is going to have impact in terms of perception of Egypt's role in, in, in the Red Sea. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. A lot, uh, a lot of issues on the agenda. Thank you very much uh, to all of the panelists. Um, I, before we turn to sort of questions, um, I wanted to just uh, give Abdul Mohammed, uh, who's unfortunately sort of squeezed out of our space here, but um, from the uh, the AU high level oh well that's right AU high level implementation panel, uh, which is led by former South African President Thabo Mbeki, uh, the, and has the mandate from the African Union uh, to for some of these cross cutting issues uh, within the Horn to just um, give some remarks on on how this impacts uh, multilateralism and, and some of the institutions there. Is that microphone not working? Maybe come around here. Oh, don't sorry. Come to the big table. Come to the big table. Uh, thank you, thank you very much and uh, for this opportunity. Uh, this morning's uh, uh, seminar, uh, when Princeton uh, was kind of giving a closing remarks, he said something like, you know, through this process we have somehow exposed the complexities and the challenges that's facing the two regions. And he's absolutely right. This conversation started in Abu Dhabi about a year ago in a very amorphous way. And then it moved to Khartoum under the auspices of the African Union, start taking shape, and we are here at USAIP where it's getting sharpened. And uh, I think uh, the conversation should continue uh, until our policy makers start internalizing some of the arguments we are having a discussion uh, over. So the interconnectedness of the region between the Middle East and uh, Horn of Africa is historic. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for all practical purposes, historically they are one. The three Abrahamic religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, in the Horn of Africa, they are as indigenous as they are in the Middle East. They, are, they didn't come through, uh, you know, how do you say, uh, uh, missionaries. Uh, they were part and parcel, and they shaped our culture. They shaped the way uh, we look about everything, basically. So the interconnectedness and its present manifestation is crying out for attention by the current policymakers. And so what we are doing is basically to bring to the attention of our policymakers how the, the, the region uh, is, uh, is, is uh, changing. So Horn of Africa is exceptionally complex, exceptionally complex system of politics, security, intersection. And uh, this operates both at the national level, at the regional level, and also at the local level. This is manifested. In addition to that, we are interfacing with a region that has even a more complex political and security challenges. So when you have the two together, uh, uh, well, OK. 
so you have a situation where there are age-old conflict. You have a situation where there are recurrent conflicts. And you have a situation in which emerging conflicts are taking shape. And the problem is none of these conflicts of the past have been resolved. Okay, the best we have done is to manage them without solving them. And now the chickens are coming home to roost in some ways. So, uh, 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 and what's happening uh, in the region, you know, will, will manifest itself eventually at the local uh, uh, level. Now, uh, this morning I heard with fascination about the flurry of activities that have taken place. The visit of uh, the Turkish president to Egypt, the base, uh, what's happening here, some about the Nile issue, and all of the current Al Jazeera, you know, uh, covered uh, uh, breaking news items and all of that. I think what we should, uh, how do you say, how to, to, we should come to grips with is this flurry of activities are not driven by a thoughtful strategic uh, approach. They are not strategically driven. They are actually driven by, uh, for lack of a good English word, by survival. Everybody is on the edge. And therefore, they assume the worst about the other. You know, and, and it's driven by that. So how do we calm them down? All right, calming them down requires, all right, the global partners to act calmly. Okay, to, to, to be strategic, not to be uh, uh, overwhelmed by the humanitarian catastrophe only. You know, what is driving and, and, and to make the region think strategically is acts, uh, actually very important. So for all practical purposes, the Red Sea uh, is an Arab Sea and it is also an African Sea. All right. For all practical purposes, we are one security zone, and potentially, we are one economic zone. The Arab side have to realize, which they are not, uh, I must say, that the Red Sea, we have an interest from the African side in the Red Sea as much as they do. There are more people on our side of the Red Sea than on their side of the Red Sea. All right? So that, that the Arabs have not... Uh, uh, comprehended, and it will take time uh, to do so. Regarding the Nile, uh, a very good point has been made by my brother here, and uh, this morning very thoughtful remarks were made. Let me say two things about the Nile, all right? One, a principle, all right? All transboundary waters and other natural resources are always subjected to a cooperative agreement, everywhere. If you have a transboundary resources, the best way to make use of them is by cooperation. All right? And that cooperation requires, you know, the, the, the parties to understand and really comprehend the sensitivities of the other guy. You know, and to recognize that everybody has an interest and we need to really, you know, come together and see how we can address each other's interest. Now, on specifically on the Nile, there are one, two major issues I think we should think about, reflect upon. One is regarding Egypt. Egypt, I respect Egypt very much. It's a historical country. It's a very important country. Uh, therefore, I have nothing but the greatest respect for Egypt. Uh, now, Egypt's narrative about the Nile and about, especially about Ethiopia, is based, number one, this is a historical foreign policy establishment view, all right, is they always think, they always assumed that Ethiopia will be so embroiled in its internal conflict, in its civil war, that it will be incapable of undertaking meaningful development. They never thought Ethiopia will calm down for a period of time and undertake economic development. That's one assumption they had. The other assumption they made is that, given their sensitivity towards the Nile uh, water, they made sure that no international development agency, the World Bank, no international lending agency will put a penny in supporting Ethiopia to have any meaningful usage of water, not only the Nile water, the repair, the, uh, 
the, the, the feeder. You know, they didn't want any, any, and they succeeded. And they succeeded. The World Bank never touched Ethiopia's uh, uh, quest for uh, utilizing, not the Nile, but the, uh, the tributaries. All right? So the fact that Ethiopia said we have developed enough and sustaining our development requires ABCD, and part of the ABCD is building hydroelectric power to fuel this development and also provide for uh, integration. The Egyptians didn't know what to do. They really, and, and, and by the way, the Egyptians also uh, neglected uh, their Africa policy totally. But one of the geniuses of Meles was he made the dam, not only an Ethiopian dam, but an African dam. All right, and he succeeded in mobilizing Africans, not you know looking, not looking for money uh, to the to the World Bank and others to finance it, but to generate the finance for the dam internally, and therefore an indicator of Africa Renaissance. And then when the Egyptians woke up to this, the train already left the station. Okay, and now. Uh, and the other thing that the, the, the Ethiopians did, uh, which is very important, uh, and uh, our Sudanese colleagues here will understand uh, better, is that historically, historically, Sudan has been looked as a footnote to Egypt. All right? Even the Americans and the others, whenever they want to craft their policy towards Sudan, the first call of du uh, port was Cairo. And, and for a long time, people looked towards Sudan with an Egyptian eye, all right? In the past 20 years, out of a very complex set of things, the Ethiopians strategically, incrementally peeled Sudan out of Egyptian hand and integrated it into Africa, all right? And this is a nightmarish scenario for the Egyptians. And therefore, the response to that has a clumsy tendency. Yeah, you know, and 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 uh, so there is there, there is that uh, uh, aspect to it. But uh, uh, to conclude on the Nile issue, there is a framework document they signed in 2015. It is a good document. It articulates everybody's interest. All right. Therefore, try to get the politics of the Nile right requires us to reflect on that document and make it more substantive than it is now. Now it is a declaration of principle. It's not binding, all right? So you translate it uh, uh, into that. And I think everybody's interest will be agreed. To do that, everybody has to be strategic. We cannot afford but to be strategic to face to the challenge that we are facing. And lastly, uh, all the issues regarding the Red Sea uh, and, and uh, the Horn of Africa, the interface, cries out for a multilateral solution. Okay, and I must say that when it comes to multilateralism, to articulating collective security, to articulating collective, uh, you know, uh, collective uh, win-wins, all right, and there is no substitute for multilateralism, all right? And Africa has gone far beyond in trying to resolve all of its problems through multilateral system than the Arab world. The Arab world, as a matter of fact, they have never utilized properly their multilateral in, uh, instruments. The Arab League is irrelevant to all of the problems that are going on. You know, The GCC are just a private domain on one or two countries. Therefore, that multilateral, principle-driven institution to address common issues is lacking on the other side. And this, I submit, the African uh, can teach a great deal. All right, and then which brings me to, to a conclusion, the role of the outsiders, especially the Americans. The Americans have been providing the region as a whole with some kind of a security umbrella. All right, that is now at best diluting. Okay, at worst is, is, is regressing. And th therefore a scramble is taking place, not on the African side, on the Arab side especially the Saudis and others, are extremely jittery, extremely nervous. So they are taking unilateral action that is contributing to instability. All right? And uh, the, uh, on the Africa side, we were just waiting, listening, uh, 
uh, to the Americans of what their policy towards Africa in general and to this region in particular will be. All right? Nothing. All right? The only thing we heard, uh, you know, I, I tell you, in the African Union, there is this uh, anxiety about U.S. currently. And that anxiety is, will we hear U.S. policy towards Africa through Twitter? All right? Or will there be a visit by some high-level people? All right? The only high-level person that visited Africa recently is the Minister of Defense, the Secretary of Defense. And he went to one place, well, he went to Egypt, that's, a, that's traditional, but the only other place he went was Djibouti. Okay. Nikki Haley is another issue. Uh, Okay, uh, let's, you know, uh, let's uh, I'll wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, the American policy towards Africa and the region right now, the only uh, conclusion we can draw is really military, security. All right? Security. American investment in Africa in that region is very minimal, while the, the Chinese is gigantic. The Indians are second, another very substantive in, 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 in investment. You know? Therefore, American foreign policies craft towards the region could increase the instability, all right, could potentially also be a gap, a stop gap. So we are waiting to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, obviously a lot to, to digest uh, and discuss and uh, contest potentially, um, but it, it does strike me that one of the common threads that emerges here is the need for not just security solutions, not just you know humanitarian development investments, but political investments and what that looks like uh, across whether it's multilateralism, whether it's other frameworks. So um, why don't we open it up uh, for questions? We have a little over half an hour uh, for that. Uh, if everyone's still pondering their questions, I can throw some out there, but um, if you can just sort of signal to me in some fashion, uh, I will try to call on you in the order uh, in which you've done. Uh, Andrew Steinfeld, please. Um, Andrew Steinfeld, former State Department diplomat. Um, I have a question. Any, any one of you can take this. I'm a little, uh, I'm curious about the gulf in the horn. Other than the obvious, as you mentioned, destabilizing aspects of using the Gulf as a strategic playground, as their arrière pays for their internal issues and Yemen and competition with Qatar. I'm curious whether their role in countries like Ethiopia and the food, um, the food investments they're making in places like Ethiopia and Sudan. Do do you all see anything positive in that, or or is it? wholly a kind of negative um, influence on a part, a part of the world that they, they just now want to project their issues onto. Does somebody want to, do you want to take that question first? Anyone? Please. Uh, uh, I think it's a good question, Andrew. I think what it does, I think the, the countries on that, and Ethiopia in particular, because it's landlocked, and depends tremendously on its access to the Red Sea, that they do, the African countries depend on that trade route heavily. So they, are, they, they have a direct interest. Now, it hasn't been challenged before in the way it is now. And, and the alliances that are cutting across Sudan, Yemen, uh, that kind of thing, um, raises all kinds of questions and nobody quite know what it means. What does it mean for the UAE to take management control of almost every port down the west side of the? To the African states, what does that mean? What is the strategy there? And is it benign? Is it not benign? Um, and it uh, it aggravates things like the Eritrea Ethiopia dispute because the Eritrea is taking full advantage of all of this to come out of isolation. So I, it seems to me that they, have, they may have uh, not articulated this in the past, may have taken that for granted, but it's vital economically, isn't it, wouldn't you say? Would anyone else like to jump in? Abdul, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think uh, um, uh, there are positive aspects which we need to encourage. I mean, the investment in the region is meaningful. Uh, 
but I, as Princeton said this morning, and that's why I mentioned multilateralism, uh, etc. Because in a multilateral setting, your investment, your security policy, etc., lends itself to some transparency. All right, but the Arab have a habit of doing business one to one. All right, and and which opens up to corruption, which opens up to deals that will have ramification in internal governance. All right. So this approach, this system uh, that is, uh, you know, different needs to be somehow harmonized. But the last thing I, I, I want to point out is access to the sea is very important for the Horn of Africa. All right. Especially for Ethiopia. We are 110 million people with no port. So we depend on the, the, the smaller countries in the Horn to, give, to provide us access to the sea. But the problem is most of these countries uh, that, are that will potentially, uh, we only have one port uh, through Djibouti, even if there are potentially others, are already bought by the Emirates. Okay, Kisimayo, start down, Kisimayo, bought by the Emirates. All right, Mogadishu, the Turks. Barbara, the Emirates. Bosaso, the Emirates. Uh, Asab in Eritrea militarized for purposes of conducting war in Yemen. So it's all militarized, and we are 110 people there uh, uh, surrounded. Uh, uh, you know, therefore access to the sea becomes very important. So a country like Ethiopia's uh, uh, strategic vulnerability must be understood. And whether the Emirates and others understand that, I'm not sure. You know, but these are the kind of the, but uh, for for us uh, to assume that they will understand our, vulnerable, our, our vulnerability, we need them to be transparent in the relationship. Yeah, you know, if they bought the port of Barbara for three hundred million dollars, most of it bribed to parliamentarians to vote on it. You know, what makes them change their mind if there is a problem with Ethiopia? They will say to Barbara, close it. They could say, you know, they are, most of them are transactional countries that are surrounding us. And the Arabs are, by and large, transactional. So this does not lend itself for transparent multilateral approach to resolving outstanding issues. Thanks. Annette, sorry, Annette had a quick comment, and then Michael. Um, yeah, I, I just would like to add on this that the question, of course, is also who is responding on the, on the other side. Um, and I wouldn't take it as just a one-sided issue. I mean, what kind of countries are responding and why don't they have um, a regional approach to this? It's, it's very bilateral. It's very, you know, why are they bought off in, in, if it's all transactional? And why don't they see or why don't they perceive of themselves as a region that needs a m much more regional strength, not only security-wise, but also economically? And I think this is to me just to add on um, to this. That's not just for the Gulf states. That's for that's for China. That's for India. That's for everybody else, including the Europeans, on their migration because they also try to be very bilateral and not regional. And I think this is where the strength needs to come from from the perception on on the Horn side as well. I was just going to say quickly that um, these are not robust national security and diplomatic bureaucracies that have extensive knowledge of these regions. This is quite new. Uh, and I don't, I think these are significant investments that have uh, some potential. Uh, but perception is quite important. Uh, and I don't know that, um, that the Gulf countries have internalized um, just how important and how delicate that is as a diplomatic matter. I, I think um, there is uh, a reductive uh, relationship-based approach to some of this that is not focused on, on institutions. Um, and that lends itself to uh, uh, opacity and a lack of transparency. And so I, I think one great danger is that uh, there hasn't been much thought given um, to what anybody thinks is going on. I mean, how, how do, do these countries, how do these regions, how do these societies view these uh, infusions of, uh, of investment? What is this all about? Um, the Gulf countries have just not done a very good job of, of, of getting that message across, if there is one. I would rather take this even to, to uh, have a historical per perspective. The, uh, there is a professor, Professor Borsok, who wrote about 
uh, uh, the, the, the historical relationship between the Horn and, and the Gulf states. Uh, in his book entitled Empire, Empire in Collision in Late Antiquity, uh, uh, and he explains the competitions, changing relations, and interactions between the Horn of Africa and the Gulf. The book explains how the Gulf sheikhs at, at that time found it increasingly effective to lend their support to client peoples in marginal areas where conflict between the superpowers could be played out more remotely. And at the same time, across actors in the Horn, who are trying to fulfill their irredentist claims. What's happening today uh, in, in that part of the world uh, is similar to what happened in the in the third or uh, fourth uh, centuries, uh, centuries AD. If you see, most of the contracts are signed between uh, the Gulf countries and uh, fragile regional administrations of so so Somali regional states, Somaliland, Puntland, which goes up to uh, Kismayo and so on. The only country you will find uh, that, that is relatively stable is Djibouti. Uh, we know what, what where Eritrea find, finds itself. So it, it, is, it, it is also some of the Gulf countries are taking strategic advantage into the weaknesses of of uh, of, of these countries on on the African side. Uh, I, I agree with with, with Annette when, when when she says. The region, the horn, has to take uh, itself also. It, it has to do its, its, its homework. There is no question about it. But how can you do that when Somali regional states are not, do not have a framework in which they can regionally uh, talk or negotiate with, with other countries in, in the region? So there are structural, structural challenges as well to, to address this. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, and I, I think it's a it's a it's an important issue that probably merits its own uh, lengthy discussion, and maybe we can come back to it a little bit later. But uh, Jason, you sorry first. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I'm Jason Mattis with AECOM. Um, thank you very much. A very interesting briefing. Um, uh, and given the complexity and the complete and the competing interests of a series of regional actors, these regional actors are also responsible for negotiating a solution to the conflict in South Sudan and in Sudan. Do you feel that, the re region, that these regions, that these interests, that they can mediate, sorry, towards a solution that's good for South Sudan or good for Sudan? Um, because I think the future is in the hands of these competing interests. Thank you. Abdul's probably in a better position to answer this, but let, I'll tell you what I think. I think what's happening is that um, Sudan's uh, ability to play on a lot of these different connections now, and Ethiopia concerned with internal matters, that EGAD is actually weakened and, and Uganda is strengthened. Uh, and Uganda has always been the, the outlier in our attempts at peace in South Sudan. Uh, my perception, therefore, and then President Kiir plays on all these things. He plays with the Egyptians and all the rest to strengthen and stay in power. So I don't think the, uh, this has all been good for the South Sudan peace process. But Abdul, you, you know that better than I. Well, uh, look, uh, the good thing is that uh, there is a tradition of conflict resolution through multilateral framework, as I said. All right. Therefore, the fact that in the region, uh, both reinforced by the African Union and the sub-regional organizations, IGAD, to handle peace and security uh, challenges through some multilateral forum, multilateral mechanism is good. All right. But the problem we are now facing is uh, two, 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 two problems. One problem is uh, we have discussed this with Ambassador Lyman uh, uh, sometimes back. You know, even the Americans, when they make their strategic choices, they say, how many wars can we fight at one time? And they said, only two or three, all right? Uh, how many conflict resolutions can we do at one time? One, two, the rest will subcontract it, all right? No, so this is, this is the way they, uh, they think. IGAD is really saddled with, uh, with monumental challenge. And in the past three years, they are basically monopolized by South Sudan. Okay, so they are exhausted by South Sudan. 
there has been 14 or 13 summits on one single issue in South Sudan. All right, so they are, all, you know, they are overwhelmed. The UN and other multilateral institutions are giving them support, but they are really overwhelmed. And this is their last gasp. All right, so I hope they will succeed. If they don't succeed, you know, we don't want the South Sudan issue to fall into a bilateral arrangement. We want some another multilateral institution to pick up the pieces, and that could be the African uh, Union. So we are really at, at, at this uh, uh, juncture. But uh, um, uh, IGAD has played one useful role, I hope they will sustain it, is they are, because of this collective endeavor, they are really managing restraining member states not to take unilateral action. All right. And they are not doing it 100% successfully, but they are trying to so that Ethiopia and Uganda will not be at each other's neck and they are uh, behind the scene. But at least, you know, it is restraining them. So the, 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 there, there, is, uh, uh, there is that. But no really, you know, no, by and large, no solution for a kind of region that we have and for the kind of countries we have assembled, you know, begin, being a mixture of failed states and state trying to do the right thing uh, outside of multilateral uh, mechanism, you know. So U.S. should continue to support multilateralism, even though this administration's view towards multilateralism is negative. You know, that is the only way, if you want to get engaged in Africa, that is the only way, multilateral. All right. Otherwise, you know, you'll have a situation in which, uh, you know, the Qatar and the other uh, Arab countries, the Gulf countries uh, problem, you know, uh, if it was Africa, we would have sent an envoy to Qatar. We would have sent wise people. We have we would have sent, uh, you know, a bunch of all the, you know, uh, head of states, whatever, to try to, medi to mediate. You know, we would not have cut them off. We, have, we could not have condemned them. We would not have isolated them. You know, so that gives you a sense of there is a developed culture of multilateral approach to problem solving in our part, and it's missing in the other part. I think one of one of the challenges in moving forward with the peace process in South Sudan is the fact that other extra regional actors having their their role within within IGAD. Previously, the, the IGAD region has been trying to make sure that. All of them speak in one voice, especially for for example when the CPA was 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 signed. But on on South Sudan, Uganda has been fairly an outlier, but Igada as a region has been trying uh, to to contain the damage that uh, that emerged. Now the challenge now we have is Egypt has joined Uganda. What will happen? In in, in my view, Igad might not be exceptionally unified to, to deal with the issue. But if you take out uh, the peace process from the, from the IGAD region, IGAD member states are going to be spoilers in my, in my view. It is better to, to, to keep them within, within, within the game and then see how best you can coerce some actors who are outliers to, to have a positive uh, contribution. Let's take um, a couple questions just because we're sort of halfway through our question time. So let me take two questions in a row and then we'll go piece. Uh, David Shin, you were, and uh, please introduce yourself. David Shin, George Washington University. This might best be directed to Michael. It's a Niall Waters question that we actually talked about this morning. And I'd be interested in, in your views as to what are the prospects for Egypt taking another look at its agricultural policy and rather than trying to green the desert with very precious Nile water, uh, use water in a more precious sense. Is there any prospect for that? Thank you, David. And Michael Lunt, I think you had your hand up. Uh, not to add to the catalog of problems and, and actors, uh, but um, only Abdul made mention of China. And I'm just wondering whether uh, this panel of experts can uh, pull forward some sort of conclusions as to the net effect currently and per potentially in the future on ameliorating the situation or worsening the situation of China, given its in interests in food and, and investment and so on. Thank you. 
then we'll open it up for the yeah i mean I, we talked about it earlier i mean water management irrigation practices uh there's a lot of scope for improvement and um i have to imagine that any kind of amicable uh resolution is going to have to include some changes of behavior and practice uh, in egypt this isn't a new issue this has been raised uh, for many years um, uh, it's a difficult time for issues of governance in Egypt. Um, that being said, um, there have been steps taken on other longstanding issues like subsidy reform that people have uh, shied away from and avoided for, for many years. Um, uh, and so maybe there will be an appetite for uh, this kind of uh, big venture, um, more so than in the past. Uh, but it's not new. Uh, it will have to be, it will have to form part of the basis for uh, uh, a resolution. Uh, you know, it, better water management is going to lead to less demands uh, on, uh, and and so, yes, uh, I hope so. I don't know how it gets resolved otherwise. Um, but again, long-standing issue that hasn't been dealt with previously. Um, would you like to comment on China? Or? Yeah, I'd say some things about China, Michael. Um, China's very active, of course, in this region. You you go to Ethiopia and you see huge amounts of investment and presence in China. They're also looking at Eritrea. They're looking at a number of other countries, and, and they invest a lot. Um, their, their agreements are also transactional. That is, they're not transparent. And that their the way, it, along with the others, contributes to a non-democratic, uh, autocratic kind of system and, and patronage systems. We can get into all the depth of that. Um, some people feel, and I don't have the figures, that China is driving a lot of these countries into very high debt levels. Uh, and if that's true, it makes these countries very dependent on China, either to restru restructure the debt or forgive it or something else. Uh, I, I've heard that. I, haven't, I don't have the figures for it. I would like people to think from a perspective of uh, the developing countries, African states. If, if you don't have alternatives for investment, if you can't get an alternative investment, it, having something is better than nothing. It's a choice between nothing and something. If the West can invest, uh, the richer countries in, in the West responsibly encourage their companies to invest and create alternatives for, for, for some African countries. There is no reason why they, they, should, they should choose uh, uh, be, be between, uh, between them and, 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 and the Chinese. At the same time, it is the institutions, the capacity of those institutions in those developing countries that would matter to, to, to manage uh, Chinese investment. Ethiopia somehow has, has, has uh, successfully managed to some extent, uh, the investments of, of, of China. The debts uh, or, or the borrowing that comes from China are, uh, are taken by the most productive and effective and efficient companies, for example, Ethiopian Airlines, that has linkages with uh, Boeing company, is, is using the, uh, the money that it borrows, the Ethiopian government borrows from, um, from, from, from China in, in an efficient and effective way. Can, can, can one help those institutions in developing countries to have the capacity to manage uh, the finances that come, whether to make those investments um, uh, pretty efficient and, and, and effective. Uh, if, if you go to Beijing, uh, you will find a lot of companies producing goods for, for, for American markets. Can Africans also have those capacities to, to manage what kind of goods they, uh, they receive from, from China. Those are some of the questions that one, one might uh, be interested to think, to think about. I, I think Ambassador David also can, can comment on that since he wrote uh, extensively on that. Were you trying to say something? Well, maybe just, um, just to add on this, I think it's also, this is coming back to, to the US and to the Europeans. What's our comparative advantage? I mean, what are we doing better? It's maybe not the resource-based um, infrastructure. I mean, at least for the Europeans, that's not that's not what we what we are known for. 
Um, but what are we what are we offering, and what what does make what would make a difference? And I think this is exactly what Abdetta said. I mean, where you know where, where are we dealing differently? And if you look a bit more to the West, Central African Republic, Congo, DRC, it's not China. It's it's basically us who are doing exactly the same there. Um, so I think the question is more maybe a bit like with the Gulf states, how how to bring them also into the fold. I mean, how to make that more multilateral in terms of economy, but also, I mean, China is, is not just there in, in Djibouti to have their own military base. They're also in South Sudan uh, as part of the UN uh, peacekeeping mission. So China ha plays various roles. Um, I think the, the Chinese idea of One Belt, One Road uh, initiative is, for example, for the Europeans, it's quite an interesting initiative that they don't see as, as, as negative. Um, it's, it's not just a competition. Um, so I think we need to also see that more creatively. But again, come back to the question: What you know? What is the comparative advantage, and what what are we doing better, and what is wanted from from African countries? And maybe also, you know, who who makes the deals? What kind of leadership? You you somebody mentioned it. You know, is it authoritarian states? Um, is it the elites? Uh, how much is that reflected with the with the population, and who who cuts these deals? And that's not just going for China. Let's just take, let me just see if we have, sorry, Abdul, but let me just see if we have any other questions for the remaining five minutes. Uh, so if everybody has an opportunity to ask, please, and then Abdul, just save your point and we can come back to it if you don't mind. Please. Oh, there. Hi, I'm Andy Snow. I'm a State Department Fellow at uh, USIP this year. Not an expert on this part of the world, but I, um, my question for the panel, if anybody wants to take a shot at it, is what do you think Turkey is doing in this, in this part of the world? Because I, am, I served in Turkey, and I try to follow Turkish issues, but this area of Turkish foreign policy escaped me somehow. And I, it's not an area of historic Turkish interest. They have their hands full at home with Syria, with Iraq, with relations with the U.S., relations with Europe. It's, you know, what are they doing in this part of the world? If anybody wants to comment on that. Thanks. I can say a few words. I think uh, the, probably the third or the fourth biggest investment in Ethiopia is Turkey. Turkey has invested billions of dollars in, 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 in Ethiopia. They have, uh, they have built uh, uh, garment industries, uh, some other industries as well. So uh, they, 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 are, uh, they, they are investing in Ethiopia. Politically, politically engaging, uh, they, they are there in, in, in Somalia. They have a military base in Somalia. They train uh, the uh, Somali federal government soldiers, uh, thousands of them. At, at the, I think that uh, that is the biggest uh, Turkish military base uh, uh, that is found uh, in, in Africa is uh, where where they where, where where they have invested in in Somalia. I think the humanitarian engagement in, 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 in Somalia is, is tremendous. They also control in the, the airport and the seaport uh, of, of Mogadishu. Um, their companies run those, uh, those two uh, big institutions that bring a lot of money to, to, to the, 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 f the federal government. Um, the, the, I think they are investing in, in the Sudan. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, even if Erdogan just showed up and uh, the issue of the Su Suakin Island became an issue, but they were there for the last three years. But the last 10 years, uh, uh, Turkey was, was active in, in, in the Sudan. Uh, that's what I, I know. Just adding on this, um, I mean, the, the, the foreign politics in Ankara, when, when you talk to their... Uh, the people working on, on the Africa desks. For them, it was also a different foreign policy, specifically Somalia and Sudan, where the, the question was more, who do the governments there trust? Um, and they felt that the Turkish government with a more political Islam agenda um, is more trustworthy than, let's say, the West in general. I'm generalizing. Um, also, I think they do have a very strategic agenda that is, who is paying for this, I think is another interesting question. I think we haven't touched on that. Is it really Turkey paying for all of these expenses or is maybe Qatar helping? I think that's that's definitely gonna be interesting. But the, the question of Erdogan right now is much more connecting to an Ottoman empire, 
idea, projecting that idea. Um, so it's not, it's not non-historical, I think, in, in that sense. And so I can, of course, is... Except it wasn't part of the Ottoman, none of these places were part of the Ottoman Empire, except Egypt and... What, so I can... Yes. Yes. Was part of it. Please. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, part of it is vanity uh, and um, the sense of what Turkey's supposed to do in the world. Um, and at times that's been quite, quite instructive uh, in Afghanistan and the Balkans. I mean, uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's oftentimes been um, uh, led to overreach. Um, and one of the things that became clear in Turkey's turn to the Arab world um, was how little Turkey knew about the Arab world. Uh, there was an assumption that they knew because, of course, there are these historical links. Um, but their knowledge of the Arab world had, had withered because they hadn't been again. That's not where their focus had been. Uh, and so they bumbled badly in places like Iraq, uh, in Syria. Uh, and some of that was knowledge-based. Um, I can't speak to, you know, I mean, they've been engaged um, in Somalia for uh, a number of years now. Um, I, I don't know. The, the, I, I have doubts as to their um, capacity, um, and I worry as a general theme of Turkish foreign policy over the past 10 years, and in particular since 2011, um, is uh, the, the, the being prone to partisanship. Uh, Turkey has taken, takes sides in regional disputes, takes sides in terms of how it approaches all of its issues, uh, and that um, that runs the risks of, of, of you know, more generally, not just in here, but runs the risks of aggravating existing fault lines. Thank you very much. Um, with just two minutes left, yeah, I was just going to offer each of the panels the opportunity to offer any concluding uh, thoughts before we wrap up, starting with Abdul, because I know you had a further thought okay. on the China uh, 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 What David raised is very important, because that's going to shape the narrative about the Nile in the future, the issue of water management. So when you see the dam, this uh, Ethiopian Renaissance dam, African Renaissance dam, it will have major implication on the future of the Nile. Why? The dam means very you know, succinctly, in Ethiopia, it's hydroelectric power. In Sudan, it's agriculture. In Egypt, it's water management. Therefore, you know, when we said we have to get the politics of the Nile right, it means coming to grips with this. And hopefully that will, 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 will change. Uh, number two, on China, uh, uh, with the minuses of the Chinese uh, system and, uh, uh, and all of the things that uh, Lyman has pointed out, China for Africa is now the most tangible country. All right? It's tangible. They have a strategic view about Africa, for good or for bad. All right? They are tangible. They have strategic view. Therefore, they are predictable. All right, and the one, uh, this one belt, one uh, road, is solidifies that tangibility. All right, so they are there, you know, uh, and 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 U.S. will end up having a very poor catch up to do. All right, uh, on Turkey, I think uh, they have uh, re responded. Turkey, one of the things that makes the Egyptians nervous, and I will understand why, is that Turkey, in addition to having this grandiose, uh, you know, vanity, you know, the person of Erdogan is, uh, you know, speaks to that. The other thing is that they are Muslim Brotherhood. They are part of the Muslim Brotherhood narrative. And Sudan is the remnant of Muslim Brotherhood. They are still there. And Qatar is another Muslim Brotherhood. So this alliance solidifying itself and having a foothold in Africa, especially in Somalia, you know, bothers the Egyptians and the Arabs. So that, that we need to deal with that, yeah. Final thoughts? Yeah, just very briefly, uh, I've been, uh, you know, I mean, I, mean I, I focus a lot on Egypt, uh, and that means that I generally focus on the Arab world. Uh, and I've been surprised with the rapidity of events uh, of the past uh, two years, and in particularly the past, the past year. Uh, and I think um, I've seen a bit of coverage this week in, in the Western press, um, but this has really kind of gone under the radar. 
uh, in a way that I mean, understandable, but um, I think slightly troubling. Uh, and uh, the pace of events seems to really be quickening, and I think we're, we're playing catch up at best. Um, I'm not sure, well, I'm actually, I'm quite sure, uh, the United States is not in a position to engage nimbly at this juncture, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, and I don't know what's there to kind of fill that gap. Uh, but what's clear is that this uh, is going to require a, a, broad, a broader multilateral framework um, uh, because of some of these bureaucratic issues. Um, but uh, that framework doesn't exist to, to kind of to try to corral all these issues under uh, one umbrella. Thank you. Very well said, Ambassador Lemon. Um, <clears throat> what I'm concerned with is, is uh, bringing an end to the war in South Sudan and how that's possible. Because that's one of the most humanitarian, biggest humanitarian disasters in the world. And what worries me is it's become harder rather than easier with all these other developments. And uh, with all respect to EGAD, they, can, they seem to be able to living with this disaster in their midst uh, and, and, and not deal with it. And uh, it's, it's got danger in itself, but it is a huge humanitarian disaster, terrible for the people, costing the United States a ton of money. Uh, and, and we're not structured to deal with this because we're not, we're not taking in the context in which all well, this is going on. And so what I hope comes out of what we've been talking about and thinking about is that we have a... Uh, a policy-making process in the, in the State Department, NSC, that takes all these issues into account. Some of them are long-term issues that go well beyond South Sudan. Uh, looks at how our various interests in Egypt, which are complex, in Ethiopia, which are complex, and I think the situation in Ethiopia demands an enormous amount of attention, and then figure out how we can solve some of these problems. Get the South Sudan things solved somehow, deal with some of these other issues, be present in the area. And, and without that, you know, uh, I, you have to spend this money, four and a half billion dollars a year, but we can do so much better than what we're doing. Thank you very much, Abdada. No final thoughts, Aneta. Um, just about what um, President Lehman was just saying, I think, I consider it's quite important to look at the developments on, on Egypt and Sudan and, and Ethiopia right now exactly for not having more conflicts if it's directly or through proxies in this region because that will have implications on South Sudan and of course on, on the region at rest. Um, and maybe as a mirror problem on the other side, if there is no stronger negotiated um, peace effort on the Yemen war, I think it, it will have rippling effects, not only on the Gulf, but again, coming back to, to the Horn. And so I think it, it would be in our vital interest to, um, to engage there. Thank you. Uh, I think um, people are not thinking uh, the, the implication of the war in, in, in Yemen. Somehow it's, it's overlooked. Uh, nobody knows for how many years this will continue. We heard that the, the war costs uh, between 200 to 300 million dollars per day. What does it mean in, in four years, five years? And how would that change the alliances uh, in the Gulf areas? And what is the implication for the Horn of Africa and, and, uh, and the greater uh, glo global world? Uh, th that shift means uh, uh, countries like Iran, Qatar, who are not bogged down in a war, uh, are saving money. Uh, how would the, the balance of forces shift in, uh, in, the, in the Gulf area? It should be one, one, one thing that people uh, have to, have to uh, uh, grapple with. Thank you very much. It's a very important note, I think, to end on. Uh, I think since we're sitting at USIP, I, I, I don't want us to conclude this conversation being overwhelmed by these very complex dynamics. They are complex, but I think uh, it's also important to note that wars have been negotiated to an end. Uh, and 
uh, and they can be negotiated to an end, whether it's South Sudan, whether it's Yemen. Uh, I think USIP and certainly another uh, a number of institutions and others uh, uh, continue to think very thoroughly about some of these ideas, and uh, and uh, hopefully there will be some leadership to to move some of them forward because it's certainly. These are gaping wounds uh, sort of in the world order, and I think we've talked a lot today about what uh, the consequences are now and uh, left unresolved. Uh, those consequences will only get uh, ever worse. Um, despite the tremendous security and, and other investments we've made, uh, it's hard to see them being uh, addressed without a commensurate political uh, investment from, from many, many actors in a, in a particular uh, uh, context. So thank you all again. Thank you to our extraordinary panel. Uh, for coming some further than others uh, and uh, and thanks so much. <laughs>